All right, welcome to lecture seven for GIC 3421, visualization for GIS. Uh, for this lecture, we're going to be covering the topic of color principles. So uh, first thing I wanted to do was just <laughs> introduce you to the idea of color and what it means. Uh, I don't know. How to... There we go. Uh, and what it means for GIS, all right? Uh, so there's a lot of different things that go into it, but essentially the the main draw of it is the fact that color is going to be an important concept uh, when it comes to producing maps and communicating to our audiences. We've already talked about cultural um, and societal views and biases that exist in different parts of the world. Color is going to play a big part of that as well. Um, so for those of you that have this open on your own, if you follow this link, uh, it just takes you to a fun GIF of a humanity, uh, which does not directly embed into PDF. So I had to use a link. So check it out. It's fun. You'll enjoy it, I hope. All right, so color and cartography. Color is a valuable tool to cartographers, but to maximize the effectiveness of our maps, we must employ color in a proper fashion. This really plays into the card graphic uh, ideology of understanding your audience all right we want to make sure that we are using colors that are going to draw our audience into what we're showing them we want it to look attractive all right and this isn't always as simple as oh i want to you know use colors that are associated you know to the type of data i'm looking at so like looking at income disparities maybe i want to use green for you know high income in areas red for low incomes or you know just a typical divergent um not a divergent a typical uh, sequential color scheme uh to try to show you know percentages of uh, uh, higher income or above certain poverty levels uh you know in different block groups we want to also make sure that we're thinking about all of our additional map features. Like, is using thick black font ideal here? Uh, should I use a blue? Should I associate a different color scheme uh, to my features? Is a background important uh, when I'm using a base map? Should I use a full color topographic map? Maybe I want to go with something grayscale, things like that. It's just the kind of stuff that we want to make sure we're taking into consideration when we're producing our maps uh, and who our audience is, what the theme, what the feel of the map is, is all going to have an effect on that. So it's also important to know that we don't all see color the same. Um, so for those of you uh, in this class that are actually taking the class, uh, not just watching this on YouTube, um, take the time to follow this link and watch this short video uh, where it'll explain how different people are going to see colors differently, all right? Because so, color blindness is not a, a simple, okay, you're colorblind, so you see this instead of that, or you see all gray. That's not how it works. There are hundreds of different types of color blindness varying degrees of color blindness so understanding that uh, among an audience is going to be important as well so take your time watch this video all right so color as we uh, think about it here uh, at least as far as we're going to think about it in this class is only going to be focusing on the visible light uh, visible light within the actual light spectrum all right we're not talking about ultraviolet or infrared things that we can't see with the human eye that's not necessarily relevant here outside of the fact that we're going to use a color from the visible light spectrum to represent maybe ultraviolet or infrared in certain data sets all right so hopefully you all remember uh, from physics uh, that the visible light uh, kind of runs from 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, you understand the different parts of the spectrum, but again, this isn't a physics class, so uh, I'm not going to expect you to remember all of that. I just need you to have that general association of where color comes from um, uh, on the light spectrum. All right, so we have two major modes of color. One is gonna be illuminant, 
which is going to be uh, is going to use a light source and an eye brain system. So that's typically, you know, we're thinking I see something, uh, you know, just light in a room that's going to be illuminated. It's illuminating. And then there's reflective modes of color. So that's going to when we have light source objects and an eye brain system. That's going to be the actual perception of the colors that we see. All right. Because the illuminated light does give me the ability to see uh, outside of black. I'm seeing all the specific colors on objects because they're reflecting light uh, and what that wave uh, that it's reflecting is going to control what color I see there. So consider that. All right, we also have two major color theories. We have additive color and subtractive color. So that's going to be our RGB and our CMYK um, color models. Those are the two major ones. But there are actually dozens of different types of color models out there. Uh, so depending on the medium in which you're going to be producing your cartographic products, you're going to have to decide, uh, you know, at the top level, do I need additive subtractive? Is this being printed or is this being shown on a screen? And then from there, break it down even further. So again, additive color is made up of red, green, and blue. The RGB color model, um, again, is additive color model, in which red, green, and blue light are going to be added together in various ways to reproduce a broad array of colors. All right. The name of the model comes from the initials of the three additive primary colors, red, green, blue. We all learn in grade school that when we combine these base colors, that's how we start to get different colors. So if we add red and green, we're going to get, what is red and green together? Well, if we add blue and green, uh, we're going to get yellow. If we add red and blue, we're going to get purple. Uh, and those are going to, you know, be our secondary level of colors. We could continue add to add from there to get um, tertiary and, and so on colors. So additive, it makes sense. We're taking different inks, mixing them together uh, onto a printed object, and that's what we get. On the computer, it really doesn't matter which type of model we use, all right? It's all going to kind of use uh, look the same on your screen. But when we go from different types of screens, that's when we're going to see that uh, RGB is going to be superior to like CMYK. So this is just a quick graphic uh, of what um, RBG is going to look like. So we can see when we combine certain colors, this is what we're going to get. Um, the other important thing to know with additive colors is that when we put them all together, we're going to get white. That's what, you know, maximizing an additive color model results in is the color white. So subtractive color. So it's going to focus on light, light reflectance reduced by ink. All right, so a secondary color is formed by the sum of two primary colors of equal intensity. So we have cyan, which we know is going to be green and blue. Magenta is red and blue, and yellow is red and green. Now, every secondary color is the complement of one primary color. When a primary color uh, and its complementary secondary color are added together, the result, again, will be white like we saw with additive colors. But here, what we're doing, because it's subtractive, as we pull colors away, our final result of subtractive colors is actually going to be black, as you see in this color model here. So we know that when we have our actual colors, we're going to slowly pull from it, you know, the, the different colors that we use to make up and to result in our primaries. And then if we take all the primaries away, now we've ended up with black. So you could kind of see how we've subtracted these colors uh, to come to that conclusion. The, it's essentially the opposite of additive colors, which should make sense because it's additive and subtractive. All right, components of color. Oh, my slides messed up here, but it says components of color. So uh, our three main components of color are going to be hue, saturation, and value. So hue is the name that we actually give our colors. Each hue is going to have its own wavelength. Uh, and if you want to get theoretical here, yes, there is an absolute infinite number of hues that exist, all right, because it can always be broken down and measured further and further. We just don't necessarily have the capabilities 
nor the desire to do so. Uh, if we were to try to do that and identify every single possible color that could ever exist, every hue that could ever exist, uh, it's the same as the big data problem. It's like, great, you've identified you know, 70 billion specific colors, but when I'm trying to make this map, I just want to have a regular color template so I can find what the hell I'm looking for. I don't need 10 pages of different shades of dark blue. Like, that'd be ridiculous. It's like when you go to the paint section in any hardware store, it's like, when do the colors stop? But hue, hue is the name we give colors. <laughs> uh, it's important to note, uh, cool colors, we're going to have shorter wavelengths. All right, and then warm colors are going to have longer wavelengths. All right, so just remember that as a simple thing. I typically remember it um, by thinking about uh, whether I'm hot or cold. If I'm cold, I'm going to want to pull my arms together. So cool colors, the wavelengths are going to be shorter. They're smaller. They're kind of closer together. Warm colors, it's hot. I want to fan out, so I want to get some space. Step back from me, please. Get your dang sweat off me. You're disgusting longer wavelengths so <laughs> fun fact that's how i uh oftentimes remember it if i'm having a brain fart all right so saturation saturation is also known as chroma intensity or purity all right it's going to be specified in percentages all right and it's essentially our draw from you know a, a zero percent a, a neutral gray to the full force of that color. So I think intensity is a good way of representing it because you can look at it on a percentage scale, all right? So 0% saturation, it's devoid of all the color. We took all of the color out. 100%, it's going to be really, really intense. So typically when we have photos, if you ever do any type of photo editing or picture editing on your phones or things like that, um, when you switch things to grayscale, that's most of the time, all that software is doing is just removing the saturation. Or if you're going to try to use like a, a vivid or a dramatic one, it's going to increase the saturation to add more power to each of those colors. All right, so value. Value is the quality of lightness or darkness. All right, it's best thought of as the shade of the hue. All right, so it's also going to be specified in percentages, just like saturation, all right? And it's going to go from a, you know, 0% that is a light kind of neutral gray color all the way to 100%, which is going to be black. Uh, so that's making it as dark as possible. Uh, a lot of times to remember value, you just think of that stupid show. What was it called? Not show that book that became 50 Shades of Gray, all right? You know, it's... I never read it, but you could see on the cover and all the memes and stuff, it goes from being very, very, you know, pale, almost, um, um, yeah, pale, uh, to being very, very dark at points. So that's just looking at the grays. You can see in the top one here. It's the same thing with all the other colors. So kind of think of it as uh, like uh, whenever you would apply like a washout filter uh, to background images in PowerPoint. All right, that all it's doing is it's reducing the value of that image. So all the colors, all the, the value of all those colors is being stripped away to try to make it look more kind of faded and, you know, light in the background. All right, so again, a video is worth eight minutes and 53 seconds. This is another video uh, that talks uh, a little bit more specifically um, about the science of color, all right, and goes into more detail on that. So again, uh, for those of you that are in this class, take the time to follow this link here, all right, and learn uh, a little bit about the, the specific science of color here, all right? So we're not going to go into too much of that in the lecture, so do that. <clears throat> all right, so color models, all right? There is a world of different color models out there. Some of these should seem pretty familiar to you, like CMYK, RGB, HSV, all right? But other ones that you might not think about so much, you know, are just going to be grayscale, HSB, HSL, um, seal lab. So these are all going to use, uh, be used for specific purposes on specific types of screens or for um, printing onto specific mediums. 
right? Because not everything can be RGB. Not everything can be CMYK. We got to find what's going to be the most appropriate um, for the format and the medium uh, which we're going to be showing our maps. So HSV refers to the components of color. It's going to be hue, saturation, and value. All right. As we talked about before, um, saturation is going to be measured from 0 to 100% as it is in this model. Value is also measured from 0 to 100%. But then our hue is going to range from 0 to 360. All right. So just looking at that, we know with hue, we're going to be limited to 360 different colors. All right, but then we can increase those numbers of colors by making adjustments to our value and our saturations. You can see it exponentially grows there. All right, so HSB and HSL are very similar. All right, um, so the B in HSB is going to refer to brightness, where B references black uh, to indicative uh, how much light is going to be received. So how much of that black color are we allowing in? All right, and then L in HSL is going to refer to lightness. So L is going to reference white to indicate how much light is going to be reflected. So they're both looking at hue and saturation. All right, but then instead of value, they're either going to be looking at brightness or lightness. Uh, and this can be more valuable depending on the, the type, the theme of the map you're looking at, uh, which one's going to be more important. If you need to make sure that you're uh, preserving blacks, you might want to use HSL. If you're going to be preserving uh, white or light, you need to make sure that you're going to use HSB. Right? There's not a whole lot of differences here between these. Uh, it's mostly just been... Uh, different regions or, or different disciplines started using different models and they've kind of stuck to it. They've dug their heels in and they're not willing to make adjustments at this point. All right, there's RGB, probably one of the most common. All right, so RGB is going to refer to additive color theories. All right, it's going to use uh, 256 values of red, green, and blue to define color. So 256 values ranging from 0 to 255. Right, this model can produce over 16 million colors, right? Uh, and it's typically going to be used when the um, output of map is going to be on like a computer screen, TV, or film. All right, these are the most common places that we're going to see it. All right, when we're printing stuff, not so much, but anything that's on a screen or captured via film, it's going to use RGB. All right, so CMYK is going to refer to our subtractive color theory. All right. It's going to look at um, the CMY each and color percentages from 0 to 100%, right? With 0 being void and 100 being, you know, full intensity. So the K uh, represents black, and it's going to be specified. Uh, it's specified because impurities of ink may not create a pure black, all right? So if you have... Um, that's why you have to have that fourth cartridge in your printers, that actual black cartridge on top of the color cartridges that are already there, just because we don't want to try to deal with any type of um, issue with it using all of that ink uh, just to create black. So it just has a specific black one uh, for printing purposes right there. All right. And then it should be used uh, at all times whenever we're printing maps. So everything we print is going to use the CMYK color model. All right, so C-Lab is going to describe colors as we perceive them by the human eye. All right, uh, so this is something that like an optometrist uh, would use to try to um, measure and identify um, severity uh, of color blindness. So different issues with your eyes can have different effects on these things. So in this color model, uh, L is going to represent lightness of color. Um, so between black at 0 and white at 100. The A is going to be relative position between magenta and green. And then B is a relative position between yellow and blue. The reason this model is so popular is because it addresses the three major um, uh, color blindness 
types of color blindness among humans. So lightness one, that's going to be if you have full color blindness, if you actually see the world in grayscale, it can be measured there. Um, the A is going to be essentially helping to identify red-green color blindness and B uh, to identify blue yellow blindness. Now there are other types of color blindness. Uh, I myself, I have, you know, a mild blue-green colored blindness. Um, all right, but it's just not one of the, the uh, as common types. All right, so grayscale. So it's important to understand grayscale, not just from a color blindness perspective uh, when we're producing our maps, but also from an economic standpoint. Right, printing things in grayscale is going to one be a lot cheaper and two be a lot faster. All right, um, for those of you who've ever worked with me on the map scanning project, all right, if you've ever accidentally left the pass through scanner on grayscale, you've seen it, it flies through there. All right, those documents, and it's scary because these are historical documents, and we're like, oh god, what did we do? It literally flew through the scanner. Um, it, it, it scans much faster, it prints much faster, uh, and it's much more economical to do so as well. The problem, though, is that a lot of people think that they can just make something in color, set the printer to grayscale, and it's going to come out ideal. It doesn't work like that, all right? Grayscale is a legitimate color model that needs, um, if you're making it with grayscale, it needs to be designed that way. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of conflicting colors. Readability is going to be a huge issue. Um, and when I require a grayscale map of y'all from y'all later uh, in this class, uh, if you do this to me and it's hard to read, like you're going to get a bad grade. So uh, take the time to actually look at it. Make sure you're using um, appropriate contrast uh, and apply the other um, cartographic uh, techniques that you've learned so far in this class to make sure that even though everything's gray, it's still very readable. All right, so again, uh, back to the color theory part of it, grayscale essentially is going to be just presenting different shades of black. That's how it works as far as printing um, and projecting on a screen is concerned, all right? It's just taking the color black and applying different levels of brightness to it. So if a map is going to be presented in an achromatic fashion, uh, we might want to use grayscale, all right? We also want to make sure that we always limit the number of grayscale levels to six or seven all right even if you're trying to do a grayscale printout of like a soil map that's going to have dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, different categories all right it's not going to work all right if you go over six or seven it, it's going to become unreadable those different shades of gray just are not going to be able to contrast with each other enough so you're either just going to have to you know, simplify that map in some fashion uh, to maybe identify regions of types of soils versus exact soil types, um, or you're going to have to go for color, and that's just the reality of it. <sighs> Dang it, this one's offset too, all right, but it says, uh, beware, not all colors translate well between um, the other color models, all right? What that means is that if in ArcGIS Pro, I produce my map using an RGB colors uh, scheme, and that's the model that it's used for, and then I want to print it, it's going to print into a CMYK color model, all right? And it might look different, uh, you know, from that printout versus what I saw on my screen. Different screens are also going to have um, different subsets of these models. So, like, there, there's more than one type of RGB model, all right, that's prevalent in the fact that we have some computer screens that have, you know, the 16 million colors, and then we have, you know, some computer screens that have, you know, 50 billion colors, you know, capable uh, to be shown there. So when we're trying to translate between them or, or not taking into account what it's going to look like on a different screen or on a different medium, all right, you might have some discrepancies in the colors you're using. Um, when I was taking this class for the first time, I actually had that exact issue. I would, at home, uh, on the, the nice screen that I did have, be producing these amazing maps, you know, and then I'd convert them to PDF, and I'd send them in, uh, and then I'd get my grade back, and she's like, all your yellows look the same. And I'm like, what? No, they don't. They're very different colors. Like, 
you know, one's like yellow, one's like a sandy color, you know, and then one day I went, finally went to office hours and I saw it on their screen. I'm like, oh, hell, that is not what it looks like on mine. <laughs> um, so uh, I was able to understand that. And then I started sending stuff in earlier for proofing and whatnot. Hey, does this look all the same on yours? And um, it was interesting that same time when I was in that class, we had another student find out that they were colorblind for some reason. Whenever the theme of a map probably should have used something like green, uh, he was always making red freaking maps all the time, and we didn't understand why. And then we finally figured out that he was colorblind. Fun facts, things that happen uh, in the jazz program at Team UCC. All right, so color preferences. All right, so this here, uh, a lot of the parts of the rest of this lecture are definitely going to fall on preferences. Um, but it's going to be important to note, it's not always about what you specifically prefer. It's about what your audience is going to prefer. So uh, in this course, uh, unless I explicitly say you should use a type of color, I try to give you as much freedom as possible to try to use what you think is the best color. right? But that's where you know your lab reports and stuff come in. You're going to pick what's easier for you. All right? But there are some, or what's best for you, but there are some basic standards uh, to consider. Um, one of those major ones being if you're going to go with a warm or a cool theme uh, for the colors on your map. Um, it's important to know cool colors when looking on a screen are just going to be easier to look at. So if the map you're producing is going to have um, you know, a lot of information, if it's, if it's just going to take time to read this map because there's a lot going on there, cool colors are going to make it easier for your audience to read those things uh, versus something like warm colors which are really going to uh, pop they're going to they're going to drag the uh, reader's attention the map reader's attention to wherever that warm color is located if you do a whole theme focused around warm colors all right it's going to become very tiresome for someone to stare at for a very long uh, period of time all right uh, if you don't think that's true I mean just sit here and stare at the the dark blue color on this color wheel um, you know for five minutes and then try to stare at the yellow for five minutes all right one of them is gonna be like wow this has been a very boring five minutes and the other ones will be like oh god my eyes are burning right now so keep that in mind all right so also think about uh, advancing and retreating colors all right so colors that are going to appear closer those are going to be our um, our warm colors our colors with longer wavelengths colors with higher values or with higher levels of saturation all right things that are going to look further away or our retreating colors all right they're going to be our cool colors they have longer wavelengths lower values lower saturation Right. If any of you have ever seen um, those pictures, you know, sometimes someone will take a picture and the whole thing's in grayscale, except for one object or one color is going to stay uh, on on the picture. Everything else will be grayscale. That part that has color, all right, it's going to pull you closer. And a lot of times with those things, you're going to see it's going to be like a, a, a yellow umbrella or a red apple or something like that. It's going to feel like it's right there. All right, uh, color preferences that are common uh, among young children. So we do know that kids typically prefer warm colors, all right? They're going to want that, you know, high level of attraction to everything they're looking at, all right? They're not going to have that necessity or, or desire to feel directed uh, by a, a specific, a calculated use of warm colors. They're going to want every point on a you know a map to be exciting and thrilling just colored vomit everywhere all right um so uh studies that have been done by um uh, liberal arts scientists social scientists things like that identified that for kids red is typically the most popular color all right um but then it's surprisingly followed by blue and green so they like something that's bright right there in their face uh, uh, and then they dial it back and they go for the cool colors afterwards um, 
the fact that it's red, blue, and green, I just always had a suspicion that it has to do with um, they might take an art class or something when they're really young, uh, and then they get used to primary colors and they remember red, blue, and green. Um, I remember as a kid, whenever I would um, go to a restaurant or something with my parents, if I'd get something, a placemat that I can color on, uh, there would always be a, like a red, blue, green uh, crayon that I get to color in with. You know, I didn't have peach. I don't know. I can't think of other colors right now. Peach, orange, and cyan. Like, I didn't want those. I would want the other colors that, that I feel more comfortable with. Um, so there's some truth to that, I think. It just Maybe it's just because it's what we're consistently given so that we associate to it more as young children. All right. They're also going to prefer thing, uh, higher saturations of colors. All right. Kids aren't going to, young children aren't going to want to have a bunch of grayscale stuff. It's going to be boring. They want it bright. They want it colorful. All right. And that stays true until sixth grade, which makes sense because then they hit puberty and they all become emo kids for a short period of time. And hopefully they snap out of it. Um, my wife doesn't believe I've snapped out of it, but I like color. So, I mean, clearly I'm past that stage in my life, right? <laughs> All right. Um, young children are also only aware of small ranges in hue. So, you know, I think this is also true with men. All right. If you show me 16 different shades of pink, all right, they're all pink to me, just like they're all pink to a child. Um, but she can tell you all the different types of pink that are right there. Uh, so that's just something else for young children. All right. Um, they dislike unattractive colors. What I mean, you know, those typical colors, if in your societal norm, those are ugly colors. Like nobody wants to be that vomit green color. Um, nobody wants to be that, you know, weird off versions of colors. You know, we want the dang Crayola colors. We want the bright colors that look good. All right. They also tend to reject achromatic color schemes, uh, and then they typically prefer things to be colored as they would expect them. So, you know, if they see an apple, they want it to be red, maybe green. All right. But definitely not blue or purple because that just doesn't make sense to them. All right. They're still driven very heavy on association. So use colors that make sense. All right, so adults, we tend to favor shorter wavelengths. So we're going to like uh, more blues and things like that. So that's obviously been tr shown to be true via fashion. Blue is like the color that everybody wants, all right? Uh, it's the most common color used for things like jeans, all right? They're going to dye them to be blue. We're not all walking around in red jeans. It just Some people do it, but most people don't. All right, uh, greenish yellow. Uh, is going to be a, a least favorite hue for adults. Um, maybe it's because we associate those types of colors with sickness a lot of times. Uh, one second. All right, color preferences again uh, for adults. Sorry, I took that quick pause there. Now I'm back. All right, um, so women are typically going to prefer uh, reds over blues and yellows over oranges. Uh, and it'll be the opposite for men. We're typically going to like blues over reds and oranges over yellows. All right. Uh, maybe that's just because um, red and yellow are more, you know, drawn colors. They're, they're brighter uh, as to where blues and oranges are going to be a bit more muted. So women typically like to stand out and men oftentimes like to blend in. Now, uh, as I'm saying this, I obviously realize that this is based on um, Western norms or, or maybe even just American norms, definitely just American norms these days. Uh, and these preferences are rapidly changing, so uh, don't feel restricted to these. These are just um, uh, historically uh, accurate preferences. Uh, a lot of things are changing a lot today. Um, I'm still rather classical in my color selections, even though red is my favorite color, uh, I definitely would prefer to wear blue or green. <laughs> All right. Um, adults also like uh, saturated colors, so I don't need to wear something that's 100% red. All right. It can, you know, kind of have that heather look to it so that it's, you know, kind of grayed out, mixed in with that kind of jersey look, um, things like that. Uh, and then in order, typically they prefer 
colors uh, blue, red, green, violet, orange, and then yellow. All right, so colors and combination. So background colors should be light or dark, all right? Not some intermediate color, all right? I either have, you know, the the figures on my map are going to be bright and they're going to have uh, a lot of color to it. So then I want a, or bold color to it. So then I want a dark background or I'm going to kind of have, or I'll have, you know, very dark figures, um, or maybe muted figures, so then I go with a light background so that it kind of flows and fits together as a commonality. All right, uh, we also want to make sure that we're consistently um, pleasing object colors are hues in green to blue uh, and other hues with little bits of gray. All right, consistently unpleasant colors are hues in yellow to the yellow green range and other hues uh, with gray. Object color must stand out from the background, all right? So I want good figure ground relationships, all right? So this just plays on contrast, all right? It's just not a matter of is it bold and striking because of its line weights between each other. Do the colors actually provide contrast between each other as well? All right, and then vivid colors combined with gray colors are typically judged as pleasant. So what that means, if I have very vivid, um, a very vivid color ramp, uh, to show my different um, areas on my map, uh, a gray kind of border or outline on those things could be very appropriate. And it's to be noted, uh, black is almost never used as a background color for anything. One, just because it's, uh, it's heavy. So a lot of people don't like how heavy that's going to look uh, on a map or a cartographic product, uh, and then also for printing economics, it's just it's completely unreasonable. All right, so kind of like I said in the very beginning, people and cultures react and perceive colors differently. Um, so you need to make sure that if you're producing uh, a cartographic product for a specific audience, Right? You need to make sure that you're taking into consideration what they're going to see and what how they're going to interpret colors. So this uh, fun infographic here uh, is going to show colors and culture. So it's going to show what is the typically considered a beautiful color uh, for a specific culture. Sometimes there's multiples there. Uh, so just to pick a few. Um, we'll do 14. 14 uh, is going to represent cruelty uh, a lot of times in Western or American cultures. So if I'm trying to show, you know, uh, uh, homicide maps or uh, suicide maps, uh, things that we consider to be cruel, uh, maybe we might use the color purple to represent that. All right, here, let's do 42 as H. Heaven uh, in Muslim. So in Muslim cultures, uh, green is typically going to represent heaven. All right, so there's just a few examples of uh, different things. Uh, definitely feel free to take a look at this um, and kind of see how different cultures perceive different colors. Uh, it's a pretty interesting infographic, uh, in my opinion. I, Definitely enjoyed looking at this the first time I found it, and that's why I added it to this lecture. So, have fun with that. <laughs> All right, so uh, on top of that, uh, colors op also often uh, reflect emotions uh, within certain cultures. So, uh, common ones that we are going to see here, you know, in the U.S., is that um, things like yellow. Uh, or light oranges are going to reflect optimism, the happiness. Think of the uh, the little smiling uh, face that we see on all of the Walmart commercials and advertisements for, you know, their rollback prices. It's it's optimistic. Wow, there's a great deal here. I feel good about this. It makes sense. You know, that's that's what it's trying to imply. 
uh, oranges are going to kind of have a more friendly or cheerful or confident color to it. Um, to, you know, uh, Harley Davidson motorcycles, maybe, maybe not friendly is the first thing or cheerful you get, but definitely confident. All right. It's, it's a striking color that will instill confidence. Fanta is going to be, uh, friendly and cheerful. You know, don't you want to want the Fanta, uh, can be the, the, play they're going for there reds are going to oftentimes represent excitement youthfulness or, or, or boldness so uh purples looking at creativity imaginative wisdom uh wiseness uh and typically uh, is the emotions we pull from there uh, blues being dependable strength trust greens peaceful growth health uh I don't know why Monster and BP and Starbucks are on there. None of those things are healthy for us. <laughs> don't trust any of them, even though I drink uh, Monsters and B Monsters and Starbucks, and I buy a BP. All right, uh, and then Gray's uh, balance, neutral, calm. All right, uh, yin yang, that type of thing. So uh, consider that as well whenever you're creating things that. Uh, Colors can be used to impose emotion on specific things. So again, this is just looking at it more. Um, what different colors can mean or um, have been used to mean. Uh, so take a look at this. Understand that a little bit more. Maybe why certain brands want stuff. And this is all marketing-based uh, color theory here. All right, but... When you're producing maps, all right, you you're, you are producing uh, a marketable product, so you are marketing the spatial information, right? We use the maps to do that. It's communication and visualization. It is marketing in a sense. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about color and cartographic design. All right, so our figure ground relationships is probably going to be the most important aspect of color and cartographic design all right it's going to provide structure readability and psychological reactions to maps all right if we're able to clearly see the definition between what's our figure and what's our ground or what are the objects in our map that are we're trying to focus on all right and, and what's just the rest of the information it gets straight to the point all right if i have a relatively grayscale map uh, and then I have a series of red pins on it. I'm going to be like, wow, what are these red pins? Clearly, I need to come here, move to this, and then you know, use this as my point of focus. This is what I'm supposed to be looking at on this map. All right? That's the purpose. All right? It's going to help. Um, Color is going to help provide contrast between our backgrounds and the focuses of our map. All right? Similar hues, brightnesses, and sap saturations uh, typically will perceive to be grouped together. All right, so if I see, um, you know, a you know good figure ground relationship, and I have three major categories that I see, I have uh, you know kind of shades of red in one area, shades of green in another, shades of blue, and and the third section. All right, even though I'm seeing different shades of all three of those colors, I'm gonna think all the reds have to do with the same topic or that they're all related to each other and all the blues relate to each other and all the greens are related to each other. So even though I'm kind of changing a little bit of that specific color, all right, uh, they're clearly being classified together. All right. So that allows us to have, you know, more dynamic or three dimensional, um, visualization of our data sets. All right. Uh, and then we're typically going to want to see warm colors to represent figures, uh, better than our, and over our cool colors because we said before the warm colors they're going to draw the attention they're going to be the focus they hold more weight on a map as to where cool colors are going to be you know more foreground you know not a big deal so depending on how much information that we're showing on a map that needs to be looked at that might uh, kind of adjust uh, whether warm colors or cool colors will be the most appropriate All right, so stronger colors should be selected for smaller areas, all right? 
If a large area of the map is covered by a high value or a high saturation or warm color, right, it may detract from whatever it is you're trying to say because now you have just this huge area. It's just a big splotch of different shades of red, right? It's just it's too much going on right there. Uh, I can't every corner of the map cannot be red. It's just even if it's different shades of it, it it's too much. It's overwhelming, but if we did blues or blue grays like that would be more appropriate it's easier to look at for extended periods it's not as harsh on the eyes so take these things into consideration all right uh, white spice can also help us establish figure ground organization by allowing the user to focus on individual components of a map so breaking things up into different regions can be very helpful using bold uh, or thick white outlines uh, that uh, for our different area units that could be very helpful as well uh, to try to break it up so it's not as intense you know you don't want thin little white lines uh, to be what we're using to divide you know really bold reds or blues or anything like that it's just we need starker contrast between them so take that into consideration as well so uh, what we're going to do here is just look at a, a you know different uh, figure ground relationships using grayscale maps and identify whether they're poor or good. So we can see here, um, A, this is going to be looking at uh, Spain uh, in the northern parts of Africa and then, you know, the Mediterranean part of the Atlantic. We can see here on the first one, all right, if I didn't say exactly what we were looking at, you might not have known which was which. Now, because we typically think of land as a foreground and water as a background, you might have, if you thought this maybe this was a land mass, you might see the gray as being ground and that being sensible with white being the water. Then when we flip the colors here for B, uh, it's just, it's actually, it's worse. It's worse than A, so... Uh, one, now you're not thinking, you still might not know where the heck we're looking at stuff, but you're not thinking that the white's going to be a landmass. The the gray looks like it's going to be on top of that. It looks like it's the focus. You know, there's no outline here, and, and it's complicated geometry. It's just not ideal. So here uh, with C, we made it a lot simpler. We used all white for everything, all right, but then we associated labels and then broke up the land masses by trying to uh, you know put boundaries for different countries there now it makes sense you see france spain portugal morocco algeria it's clear you know that the stuff that's not labeled is going to be water even if you're not familiar with the area it's like well there's not a label there so it's probably not a country which means it's going to be the ocean makes sense right uh, and then for D, what we can see is we're trying to put a emphasis on Spain. We're using color here, uh, and we're also using uh, a DEM to be represented uh, with an applied color scheme, with blue being water, and as it gets to white, that's the taller portions, uh, higher elevations. But what we did is we essentially applied a mask to everything that's not Spain. So everything that's not Spain kind of has that mask over it that makes it look a little bit more faded out. So even though we can still see the other land masses and clearly separate them from the water, we know because Spain that Spain is the focus of this map because it's going to have more color, uh, the, the saturation is higher, it stands out to the front a lot more. Um, and it's even nice that they added the, the specific boundary there uh, separating Spain from Portugal and France so that we know it's not just this random landmass that's going to be highlighted. If you don't know where this is in the world or that this is Spain, you still see it's like, oh, there's some boundary here of some sorts. Um, so the other things must have be a different region that's not associated to whatever is highlighted. Makes sense. All right, here with E, uh, again, it's a lot more simplified, um, but instead of putting all of the color everywhere else uh, or, or in all of the line work we essentially took our focus spain gave it its own unique color and did a halo around it uh, and that faded off to white so that the rest of the information goes away 
So we could see here, you know, oh, there's another mass here, here, and here, and then some water. But clearly, this central part here, this is what we're looking at. This is the focus. You do the same thing here with the shadows, all right? So what the shadows did is they made this look three-dimensional a little bit. They made it look like Spain is, is protruding out of this map. It's, it's coming at you. It's, it's clearly the focus. Look at me. I'm on top of everything else, even though there's a similar level of... Um, boldness in the color uh, for the gray, green, and blue. Right here, we're seeing it a little bit more with symbology. All right, so when we have our cool colors, all right, the, the gray background is more appropriate. And then when we use the warm colors, the black background or the darker background is going to be more appropriate. What that is is probably because this blue color is typically going to hold a lot more weight. Uh, than the warm colors, so that light background is going to make it stand out. It's going to make it contrast with it. As to where warm colors, they're going to look, you know, more floating. They're not going to look as anchored in place, so the dark background is going to just contrast better with warm colors. So going back to looking at now uh, some good and poor examples that I'll show you. Here we see in both examples, the land is green, the water is blue. But in C, everything has a bit more of a grayscale uh, or a lack of saturation or a higher rate of saturation um, on each one. So it's saturated. So it, it, it all kind of blends together, even though they're clearly, you know, one's water, one's land. It, it just doesn't look good. It's to where with D, we add a little bit more vibrancy, a little more intensity, chroma to our colors uh, so that they stand apart more. They don't have that common gray feel to them as much as they did in C. So it, it's good. It's a good figure ground relationship. All right. And then here uh, we can see with A, the black and white, uh, very strong uh, contrast between what's the figures and what's the ground. Um, you could have even inverted this to where the lands were black, the water was white, and that would have worked just fine. If you weren't familiar uh, with the shape of Australia, this one here, you know, might not work out. You could think, oh, it's this land area. There's one major lake. I don't know. Maybe it's the Dead Sea or something. And then a bunch of other smaller lakes or whatnot around it. Uh, so think about that stuff, too, if, you're, if the audience is not familiar with what you're showing them. And then here, this is poor. So we have more color, all right, but they both have uh, kind of a, a cool contrast to them all right so they, they uh, a cooler hue associated with the whole thing so they don't really stand out that well from each other that's the same issue that we saw in a lot of the other ones so figure ground relationships using colors using line widths all right using uh masks things like that to try to uh, separate figures and grounds, areas of interest, all very powerful. All right, we went over how different cultures uh, will view colors differently, how colors can pull emotion, different types of color models that exist, why it's important to, uh, to choose uh, specific color models based upon how you'll be um, providing your cartographic products. Uh, to your audience, uh, and then also understanding what your audience specifically is going to want uh, and who you're catering to, whether, you know, maybe they have color blindness or they just, their company wants things to follow a certain color scheme, whatnot, things like that. So all those types of stuff that you should just take into consideration. So that's it for our lecture on color principles. All right. Uh, if you have any questions, email me at brian.gillis at tmucc.edu, and I'll be glad to help you. All right, have a good one.